in between, say, uh, your cat and a volcano, there's ChatGPT. It's less than a cat because it doesn't have the intelligence of a cat, the adaptability, the sophisticated, not biological skills, etc. But it's much more than a volcano because you can actually learn from the environment and the output feedback into its own behavior. Now, that is the middle ground where we should definitely have a new uh, philosophical discussion. If you look at the usual Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, Philosophy uh, Action or Agency, it's dedicated to um, what we would call human agency, uh, mental, uh, teleological, for people listening to us, no, goal-oriented, uh, intelligent, intentional, a lot of properties that make it the full thing, the uh, 100% rich sense of agency. That is wonderful, but all I'm saying here is that there is a much poorer sense of agency which doesn't degrade entirely all the way to earthquake. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 105. And this episode is with Luciano Floridi, who is the Oxford Internet Institute's Professor of Philosophy and Ethics of Information at the University of Oxford, Distinguished Research Fellow of the Uhiro Institute for Practical Ethics of the Faculty of Philosophy, and Research Associate and Fellow in Information Policy of the Department of Computer Science. And beginning in the fall, he will be the Founding Director of the Digital Ethics Center and Professor of Cognitive Science at Yale University. So, for much of the past 25 years or so, Luciano has been developing the philosophy of information as its own freestanding discipline within the philosophical world. And we go into quite a bit of detail at the outset about just what this discipline is and its subjects or objects of inquiry. And Luciano's fourfold tetralo <laughs> tetralogy, uh, I, I didn't realize at first what tetralogy was meant to be. I just thought it was some arcane word, but I now understand that uh, trilogy than tetralogy. So Luciano's tetralogy, he's been working on to explicate it. So I won't get into too much more detail just about what the philosophy of information is now. But in this episode, we talk much more specifically about one particular corner of the subject, and that's the ethics of artificial intelligence. So we start out with Luciano's view of what AI at least as we currently know it. So we're not talking about uh, Terminator-like future scenarios. So we start out with how Luciano sees current AI. And he views it not as a new form of intelligence, quite roughly because everything from ChatGPT to Deep Blue to your special new microwave don't exhibit anything even approximating really human or even animal intelligence. But he views these things as having a new form of agency. So they are a new sort of thing that goes out in the world and does things. And it's a new form of agency that humans have, hopefully at least, uh, some control over. And after laying this out, we go into some future applications and developments of AI and the sorts of ethical principles we'll need to keep in mind to ensure that this new sort of agency is used morally and remains under our control. So Luciano's website, philosophyofinformation.net, you should check him out there as well as on Twitter at Floridi. And I also included in the description a link to information, a very short introduction, which is a very short book, not part of his tetralogy that will give you a good understanding of the ideas behind the philosophy of information. So likes, subscribes, follows, please. All of those are greatly appreciated. There's a discord now that you can find through robinsonerhart.com. I also have my ice cream and food eating stream at uh, Robinson Eats on Twitch and YouTube. And now, without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Luciano.
Before we move on to one of your two most recent books, I also wanted to ask you about your tetralogy, since I've never actually uh, spoken this word aloud before. And I guess it's called the Principia Philosophiae Informationis. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a joke that uh, is, is a pathetic joke. Uh, it's a very Oxbridge joke. Um, and um, and it's a joke, so it's not uh, uh, a sign of arrogance. Uh, the Principia the ar- title? Yes, it, w- it would be like beyond belief. I mean, but um, so I was joking with uh, some colleagues in the nineties, and I was saying, "No, look, I, I really think that we should have this thing called the philosophy of information. We have philosophy of so many other subjects. Is the perfect way of understanding the digital revolution from a philosophical perspective. So this philosophy of information should include, say, an epistemology of uh, information, a metaphysical ontology of information, uh, an ethics of information. So the whole thing." Uh, as far as that you know, digital revolution information is concerned. And, and so they were talking to this colleague of mine, who's uh, a classicist, uh, he's now in Cambridge, actually. Uh, I said, well, I really need this foundation. So it's a bit of a principia mathematica, but for the philosophy of information. So, well, well, that's the way you could call it. So, and then I realized that anyone who had ever published anything about principia of anything was from Cambridge. Uh, Newton, uh, E.G. Moore, <laughs> Principia Etica, uh, Russell, of course, uh, and, and uh, Wyden and Russell, Principia Batman. So uh, well, that's, that's the beginning of the joke. Okay, so look, no, we are 3-0 against Cambridge. <laughs> At least we can lose one against three, and it's a poor one. No, don't, don't, I mean, it's just putting oneself at that level is ridiculous. Um, that's just how the beginning of the joke. So we have to have the, the Principia from Oxford as well. <laughs> uh, and with that joke, uh, the, the name it developed. But essentially, um, it was um, a meeting uh, Peter Momchilov that made a huge difference. So Peter is, um, is the editor at OUP for philosophy. Uh, we were both much, much younger, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and I asked Peter, how, how does it look if I start working on this huge project, uh, many volumes, but one by one, sort of methodically, but uh, is that okay with OEP? You say, oh, Luciano, don't worry. I mean, as long as every volume, it, you make sure it's a standalone, we can keep going. So, and so the first one uh, of this uh, Principia sort of project uh, became the philosophy of information. Oh, zero imagination, because the second one, volume two, the ethics of information. Volume three, the logic of information. <laughs> volume four, the politics of information. And now we're getting close to the topic for today. Because all in four uh, became way too big. Uh, now, the other three are plenty, but this one was immense. Like, it was like more than a thousand pages. So, I, so Peter said, Look, we, this, this is a bad idea. Like, uh, <laughs> no one's going to read it. No, it's too big. Said, Why don't you divide it into no, parts? I said, and it was a great recommendation um, because uh, the politics of information is dedicated to artificial and sociopolitical agency and the difference that the digital revolution makes to that form of agency. Now, think for a moment, and the digital revolution that makes a difference to artificial agency and then is artificial intelligence. And of course, the other side is the policy of information, digital sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera, and democracy. So I simply divided, um, I gave the Rice lectures uh, in, in, um, on, on the whole thing, and it didn't quite work. So I could tell that, no, people were very nice. It's all very interesting, but it had to be too high level. So to do two volumes uh, um, properly uh, or divide this no, volume four into two halves um, was the best idea. So one is 4A, or the policy of information is called the yeah, ethics of AI, and uh, 4B, which is currently under uh, a work in progress uh, 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 I'm developing at the moment, is actually called and it will be called the policy of information, but it will be just the second half of Volume 4. Volume 5, and then I hope to retire, is the hermeneutics on information. But for that, I need to study so much more. <laughs> well, let's start with the first half, then, of the politics of information, which is the ethics of artificial intelligence. And I think that the quite natural place to start here is with artificial intelligence itself, which is, of course, I mean, a huge area of debate within the philosophy of mind. But you've already used this word agency a few times. Am I right that your way of approaching artificial intelligence is to conceive of it 
not as a new form of intelligence at all, but a, a new form of agency? Completely. Um, uh, I think that that is a, a much more fruitful, uh, a more correct way of understanding what we're doing. I mean, AI has, um, by now, a long history, uh, you know, about 70 years or so, uh, at least of uh, theorizing, and certainly about half, at least half a century, if not more. If you include cybernetics, I mean, we have, uh, again, uh, about, well, in a little while, it will be a century. <laughs> Uh, of, uh, of research. Um, but if you look at um, the origins of AI, um, and oversimplifying, and I, I hope who's going to watch us uh, will forgive me, but there are really two sources, um, especially if you look at the more institutional, departmental, etc., within the university. Of course, today AI is developed by uh, companies mostly. It's either um, part of the cognitive science enterprise trying to understand. Uh, Cognition, biologically, artificially, etc. Or, and it's a, it's a strong or, it's not, uh, not a, a logic or, uh, a engineering um, is a branch of problem solving engineering artifacts that can deliver whatever needs to be delivered, assuming that if it had been delivered by humans, humans would have exercised intelligence, but no, uh, artifacts don't have to. Um, now, the cognitive uh, side of AI has been a complete uh, failure. We have nothing that resembles the intelligence of the cat you have, a spider, a mouse, uh, a bird. Um, that kind of round intelligence, the intelligence, for example, of jumping away, uh, finding food, uh, and going to sleep, or uh, being careful when something is being thrown at you and you avoid it, uh, etc. The whole thing that we call uh, intelligence uh, of some kind. Um, the engineering side has been an amazing success, and the sky is the limit. Fast forward, and what's the difference here is that we don't care, really. I mean, forget about the hype, the the, ne the news, the newspapers. Uh, deep down, what we really care is, is this thing actually able to deliver the goods? Does it? No provide the service? Does it solve the problem? Does it take care of the task? And whether that is um, done at zero intelligence or not, nobody cares. So Deska, a great computer scientist, had this beautiful, in one of his manuscripts, this beautiful quote saying, uh, asking whether a computer can think is as interesting uh, as asking whether a submarine can swim. Not the issue, just not the point. Um, so I'm surprised that today uh, so much is uh, said and uh, discussed when it comes to AI, intelligence, um, existential risk, the new uh, apocalypse. Um, we might discuss this maybe later, but I find it uh, at the same time um, irrelevant and distracting from the real issues that we do have, significant issues, because once you face a new form of agency, uh, then what you do with that agency uh, and what the agency can be let automatically to achieve, but well, that is the real issue. But whether that is intelligent, conscious, uh, has goals, or, this is just rubbish. I mean, um, and I'm sorry that we're wasting so much time, especially social attention on these issues, distracted from the real problems. Well, without wasting too much more time on it, I just want to clarify then. So you're using or you're leaving intelligence somewhat murky and undefined. So we can agree that chat GPT doesn't function like my cat's brain or a spider's brain or my brain. Um, and we're instead just focusing on whether or not something can solve a problem or deliver the goods to use your, your phrase. Exactly. So whether the uh, object or the system or the engineered artifact in question uh, does or does not deliver the good. Um, of course, AI is much more than a, a windmill uh, or a car. Uh, the peculiarity of, of that, and that's why I use the agency, you know, a little bit you know, carefully, is not only it interacts with the world and makes a difference to the world, uh, it does so being able to uh, collect data from the world and change its behavior according to the feedback that it receives. So that's why the agency in question is not, say, the uh, agency of an earthquake or a volcano or a river. A river does change the world. Of course, a volcano does that on earthquake, but it doesn't 
quote unquote, a lot of quote unquote, learn from its own uh, output. That's the difference. So in between, say, uh, your cat and a volcano, there's chat GPT. It's less than a cat because it doesn't have the intelligence of a cat, the adaptability, the sophisticated, not biological skills, etc. But it's much more than a volcano because you can actually learn from the environment and the output feedback into its own behavior. Now, that is the middle ground where we should definitely have a new uh, philosophical discussion. If you look at the usual Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, Philosophy uh, Action or Agency, it's dedicated to um, what we do call human agency, uh, mental, uh, teleological, for people listening to us, no, goal-oriented, uh, intelligent, intentional, a lot of properties that make it the full thing, the uh, 100% rich sense of agency. That is wonderful, but all I'm saying here is that there is a much poorer sense of agency, which doesn't degrade entirely all the way to earthquake. Halfway through, we find the systems that we're building. Agents able to interact with the world, learn from the interactions, and therefore modify accordingly and successfully the interactions with the world. We should not confuse them either for an earthquake or for anything resembling even, uh, as I said, a spider. No, your cat is way above. Or a parrot these days. If you have followed the debate, you know, the stochastic parrot, a bit analogy, parrots are way more intelligent. Mm. And... In uh, early on in the book, I think this is just in the introduction, you have this very, very powerful sentence, I, I find. And it's, you write that AI is an unprecedented divorce between agency and intelligence. And so the crux of this revolution then is that we now for the first time have things like chat GPT that without anything like human intelligence have this tremendous capacity to go out and alter the world, so to speak, in a distinct way from, like you mentioned, earthquakes. Yeah. Well, um, if you think of what ChatGPT uh, or anything like Dalhi or Bard or you know, all these uh, uh, new uh, systems that are based, maybe something we can cover in a moment, on the new AI, uh, very different from the symbolic AI that we had when I was a uh, teaching uh, in, in the 90s uh, students. Um, the major real radical difference is this um, ability to carry on tasks or solve problems at zero intelligence. Now, for people who find this a little bit counterintuitive, uh, just pick up your phone and play chess against it. It will not trash it <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, and you must acknowledge at least that much that your iPhone or your phone, your smartphone, is as intelligent as my grandmother's no, uh, fridge. Zero intelligence, no matter what we mean by intelligence. So there's always room for semantic no, debates, but uh, pick up a phone, play chess against it, zero intelligence, complete success. That's what I mean. Why? Because it's able to do things with that degree of success at a purely syntactic level with zero understanding, zero sense of relevance, truth, context, uh, importance, priority of tasks. So the joke that I normally crack is that you know, if you start to, uh, playing against your phone uh, in a building, chess, you're going to lose. At the same time, if the alarm goes on, you stop playing and you run out because and your phone will keep playing. Uh, obviously, that's what it's meant to do, <laughs> winning uh, at, uh, at chess uh, when uh, using the app. So the bottom line here is that this divorce is unprecedented. Nothing in the past has ever resembled an object that we built that can carry on tasks successfully as zero intelligence. When we do that, now imagine driving a car, parking it, uh, playing chess, uh, flying uh, a drone, uh, buying the best ticket online, you name it. At zero intelligence, disasters, complete disasters. No. Now, just parking a car at zero intelligence. So now, and I know several people do that now, regularly. <laughs> so shh, don't do that. I mean, don't do this at home. Right? The uh, system, uh, the automatic parking system of a car does that beautifully, perfectly, impeccably. Now, let me add this point, because normally at this uh, stage, someone uh, raises their hand and say, like, objection. How can possibly something not be so successful as zero intelligence? Like, it, it, 
it, it should happen. Is well, that is something that we are missing, and I think is fundamental. We are adapting the world to these machines, not the other way around. Again, for anyone who thinks that this is too fancy, philosophical, uh, no, hair splitting, think about driverless cars. We're not building drones that replace you and me behind the wheel. That is Star Wars. It, it precisely Star. I know you have the special vehicle and a drone jumps in and drives it. I did the drone or um, Luke Skywalker. We we'll just redesign the car so that the car becomes a node in a network and sensors, satellites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it's able to navigate at zero intelligence successfully. We redesign the whole environment. So recently, uh, I was working with a, uh, one of the major uh, car makers in, in Germany, um, consultation about this and then, is it? And uh, they were completely clear about this. Either we modify the uh, outdoor ban, no, the motorways, then we will have no, the perfect driverless cars, or we're not going to have the perfect driverless cars if you don't change the environment. This is happening on a regular basis and is what I like to describe in a stop here, uh, the dishwasher is a, a sort of, uh, model. The dishwasher cleans the dishes better than me, more so environmentally friendly than me, must be stress, and yet it doesn't do it like me. Zero intelligence, which if I were to do the same thing as zero intelligence, not crash everything. But above all, you need to build an environment inside of which then their robot is successful. We don't build robots that do the dishes like me no, in the sink. That is, again, sci-fi. Now, if I'm right, we can come back in five, five or ten years. No, not a hundred, like many colleagues of mine pre pretend. Oh, in a hundred years, yeah, and catch me if you can. Come back in five or ten years, and let's see where the trajectory is. Are we really building androids who do things like us better than us? Or are we building you know, machines that had the environment shapes uh, around them and this in uh, industrial sort of terminology is called envelope. This envelope within which the robot can operate successfully is becoming what we do to the world. We are enveloping the world in such a way that these machines are successful. Final point, we would, when I was in the 90s, I mean, I, I published a book in 1999 or something like that. Uh, there was a chapter on, on of course, uh, neural networks, etc. It is philosophy and, computer, and computing. But at the time, we only had the models, but we didn't have the data and the computational power. It's not that we didn't know about uh, sort of, uh, neural networks. Of course, I mean, uh, they had been around for decades. It's the shaping of the world that makes these things work successfully. Only in a world in which everything depends on, on uh, content can a content machine be, at the same time, successful and threatening, or, for example, for jobs. If you live in a world where all that matters is how many uh, sort of, uh, apples you, you can collect or, or plant, etc., is all uh, at zero digital, well, you can forget about any uh, AI in your hand. So um, two points, therefore, uh, to summarize. One is uh, an unprecedented divorce, which has been made successful by the transformation of the environment so that that divorce is a success. Anyone who has ever watched one one video about a warehouse, say Amazon, knows exactly that their warehouse has been built for the robots to be successful. Because a robot that picks up things from the shelf, like behind me, is not going to work well. I mean, uh, Walmart tried to total disaster; they threw it away. The robots, no, Wal uh, the uh, Amazon or uh, any other uh, like that, they have the environment shaped in such a way that they can work successfully. That is the world we live in. We're going to live in that world. The problems are in this divorce and enveloping. Those are the real problems. Mm. I like this dishwashing example a lot because obviously, I mean, well, maybe not obviously, but developing the information processing, the pressure sensing, the sophistication of dexterity would be unprecedentedly difficult as opposed to the relative ease of just building the environment for this machine to function in. So, as we go forward, though, when we refer to AI in the context of this book and the ethics of AI, we should be thinking of AI as this artificial, unintelligent agency rather than this pie-in-the-sky Terminator sci-fi idea. Totally. And, and that might and require then, a different book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, that, that, that's totally, because then, and that understand what responsibilities this 
enormous reservoir of agency puts on humanity. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm astonished by the, the, the kind of the discourse that we're having these days because if AI as agency requires increasingly more sophisticated human intelligence in being shaped, guided, controlled, um, constrained, um, but not because it has a, a will of its own, no, like uh, the famous trolley, <laughs> uh, but because uh, it um, will be used by humans for or against uh, other humans, uh, using humans as means or ends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is between uh, humans and humans. There is this enormous capacity of problem solving and task uh, so elaboration. What we're we going to do with this? That seems to me the fundamental problem. It's the analogy I find more convincing. Is that nothing with nuclear bomb is so that, that's rubbish, but more like uh, electricity. Uh, what do you do with electricity? Um, are you going to uh, put someone on uh, on an electric chair? Uh, are you going to put the wires uh, electrified? Are you going to no, use it for uh, not white goods? Uh, is that kind of uh, energy and power that needs to be uh, regulated and ethically managed? Unfortunately, I don't think we're doing a good job these days. I, I think mostly we're wasting uh, this enormous energy uh, and problem-solving capacity with you know, things like you know, do a better search or ask better questions to chat GPT. So we have a society to reform and a planet to, sell, to sell, save. And what we do is you know, make more profitable companies that are already profitable. That's okay. I mean, no, I'm, I'm a Westerner. I, I can live with that. But surely uh, it's a huge missed opportunity. Hmm. Well, before we move on to the ethics, just pushing a little farther in, in this direction, I think that you were heading. Since this is by nature a very forward-looking project and you mention this enormous reservoir of agency that is ai how do you see the use of ai changing over the coming year years are there any new or unexpected i guess applications that will be philosophically salient for keeping in mind as we turn to the ethical questions i think there are a couple uh, i'm not sure that unexpected but um things that we should expect, um, shall we say. Um, one uh, seems to me reasonably uh, likely to happen. Um, a lot of these models or what are the sort of commercial uh, outcomes of these models are presented these days as B2C kind of solutions uh, for you know, business to consumer. Chat GPT, open to anyone, etc. Truth is that, you no. Know, the opening is uh, for further training, uh, for improvement. Um, I'm not so sure that this will be uh, the, and surely is, is a future. I mean, don't get me wrong, but I'm not sure it's the whole future. And I, I think that a lot of these um, uh, models will be uh, equally, if not more useful as, shall we say, cement between different bits of uh, the digital revolution. Uh, to be less obscure, <laughs> uh, not so much between me and, uh, say, a search engine, but more between um, the two databases that can talk to each other. Um, so uh, more uh, as a uh, way of uh, unifying bits of the digital revolution that have been moving a little bit independently of each other. Uh, say, for example, uh, making compatible two metaverses one, say, my university metaverse and my um, uh, company metaverse, okay? So how do they interact and how do they merge? How do they become compatible? Through AI. So it's not about me. It's about, you know, say, one metaverse and another metaverse. So interoperability of the two made possible by AI. So I, I think that there's a, an aspect of the um, um, unification and making the digital revolution uh, more uniform and inter uh, uh, operative, so to speak, that we will see uh, sort of, uh, AI be very useful uh, in, in developing. The other place where I think, uh, and this seems to me very likely, uh, I'm, I'm not predicting anything there, oh, wow, no, how did you possibly say it? It's happening. There's another angle which I would like to stress, which uh, I think is, uh, is a bit less likely, uh, and unfortunately so. Um, and as the AI for uh, the environment, for social good, 
I think that there's a lot that can be done there, but it won't be done by uh, companies. Um, I think it will be an application or a whole world of applications that if it develops, it will be uh, because of sociopolitical um, sort of, uh, input. So imagine uh, the, the work that uh, you could uh, have AI uh, doing for um, citizens in, in a city. I mean, a couple of examples in Europe are Amsterdam and Helsinki. They already have AI services. They are online, they are open, transparent. You can even see the data on which those AI services have been trained. Uh, and they are for very simple stuff, you know, like um, potholes, uh, libraries, uh, book return to libraries, uh, parking spaces. So totally, you know, a, a garbage collection, et cetera. So um, AI at the service of society. Um, so no longer just business to business or service to service, but back to the business to consumer, so to speak. Um, in that case, not just the commercial side, uh, but also the socio-political side, um, living in better environments because AI is helping us to make uh, those environments more intelligent, responsive, et cetera, et cetera, more efficient. And then with the same logic, the actual environment, uh, AI as a, as a green force, that's another marriage of them. Uh, no, not, not, no longer the divorce between agency and intelligence, but the marriage between the green and the blue which is another book uh, uh, where I speak of this, um, that seems to me the, the, a wonderful future that we could develop. We are not. We are underperforming. We are wasting the opportunity. And the cost of that is more serious troubles in the environmental field, sphere. But we could do that. Uh, let me add just one point. Um, if anyone who's listening wants to check, um, there are hundreds, uh, literally hundreds of uh, AI projects that support the uh, UN Sustainable Goals. Um, they are actual projects, uh, go from the underwater, you know, deep sea robotics, collecting data, all the way to uh, fire hazard, etc., uh, clean water, uh, education, you name it. So it can be done. Uh, the question is, are we doing enough? So of all these scenarios, where are we putting all our money, efforts, and real interest? In the commercial side, that is not a bad thing. Is don't get me wrong. Uh, it's just that there's so much more we could do. Uh, it's a shame that, uh, or say, you know, a, a whole arch of potential applications we're concentrating only on a very narrow profit-making, you know, commercial nature of AI. When for society and for the environment, there's so much that we could do in order to have a better society and uh, save the environment. That is, for the 21st century, an opportunity to grab. Hmm. Well, stepping back from the environment for a bit, though I'm sure we'll, well, hopefully we'll get to it again. But for now, enter ethics. One, I'm just, from this response you just gave, I'm, I'm struck by, struck again by how absurdly wide the range of applications that AI can have is. And then add to this that, AI is still such a relatively new class of technologies that, I mean, like weapons or or pharmaceuticals or anything else can be used ethically or unethically. And we really just need to have or understand, have principles or understand how to harness it or, the, or to control the, the landscape of its use. And in the book, you propose five main principles for the ethical use of AI, but arriving at them in itself was a very interesting project and a lot of work and not just your own. And so I thought you might start, or we might start by talking about the various proposals of principles and where they come from and how you narrowed them down to these five in particular. Yeah, that is uh, the, the outcome of our, uh, our research group. Um, in this case, especially one one of the graduate students, uh, uh, Josh Cowles, um, who just finished, uh, by the way, uh, just got his, uh, his PhD. Uh, and uh, he came from uh, some frustration with uh, this enormous amount of list of principles for AI. Uh, we talked about five years ago, more or less, when the whole cottage industry started. It could be six, well, maybe seven, no, time flies, but not a decade ago. And uh, at some point, uh, the problem of AI and its ethics, if you like, the ethics of a new form of agency, in my own personal view, uh, became pressing. Um, people all over the world, um, from Canada to the UK, from Brussels to Washington, etc., started putting out uh, potential ethical 
principle that would uh, guide these companies, uh, if not uh, so anyone else. It became a cottage industry in the sense that anyone was cooking its own. I remember a very, a very fundamental, important company who is at the forefront of the AI revolution these days, uh, not to be named in particular, uh, asked me to consult with them. I said, and I said, look, no, all you need to do is just subscribe to the OECD principle, for example. I know the OECD is, is a very big set of uh, countries. This company uh, is from one of those countries, so it's not a big deal. The answer was no, we need to have our own. Now, the terminology at that point started, became, become, started to, to become just a joke. Um, you know, we can't say fairness, we need to say justice. Or, no, no, justice is not the right word. We need to say uh, fair balance. So we started looking at all this list of principles, and we started noticing that it was just a matter of semantics, that they all meant the same. All they wanted to say was like, no benevolence, no malevolence, etc. So there were uh, there was a very limited amount of principles they were subscribing to, with different terminology to make my own and above all uh, mind. And this is disturbing. Make sure that the adoption of the principles was such that it didn't make any difference to the action of the company. In other words, the principles were adapted to the behavior of the company. Ethics right? shopping. And I keep doing exactly what I'm doing, but now I have a set of principles that I could put on my website. Like, <laughs> disturbing to say the least. And so with Josh and other colleagues, uh, we started uh, a comparative analysis and uh, this paper you find in the book. Ended up by not being that surprising. In other words, uh, the uh, fundamental principles of um, uh, bioethics were pretty much the same principles that we were find, you know, finding all over the place in uh, the ethics of AI, with one exception, which is not bioethics, and that is uh, explainability uh, transparency, so to speak. Because it's a new form of agency, which we do not uh, have in nature, we need to understand much better what we're building. Now, I don't know how much time we have here, but uh, if I can take a couple of minutes, I'd like to make one point clear, something that is disturbing for anyone who's not a philosopher. Every now and then, you must have heard this, you hear, we're building something we do not understand. Or, oh my goodness, these things hallucinate. Or, there are emerging properties from these mechanisms. One day, they will start walking and say, hi, how are you? Now, philosophically, this is rubbish. What is true is that we do build uh, systems that are intrinsically complex. Not as in very, very complicated but as in lots of items, layers and layers of nodes, interacting with each other uh, at such a uh, level of um, sophisticated threshold and in such a number that it is impossible by design to tell how that node no, took that particular uh, pattern in that particular etc. Et There's nothing mysterious about that. In fact, anyone who wants to check on Wikipedia the three-body problem, you already know that the three bodies, in terms of interactions and Newtonian, etc., et is already unpredictable in terms of uh, 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 deterministic equations. So the analogy here is the following. Imagine someone who wants to have a, a full explanation of what's happening, say, in, let's say, since the year, in New York, Monday morning, total traffic, and someone says, oh my goodness, it's a miracle. How did it happen? We cannot explain why every single car in that moment is there for what reason. It will be impossible, which is true. I mean, you cannot explain traffic, New York, Monday morning, 8.30, at that level of abstraction. Is there anything miraculous, mysterious, sci-fi, Monsters are coming. The apocalypse is the next. Of course not. You just don't have that level of explainability at hands. Not the level at which we are you know, used sometimes in high school. Billiard ball against the other billiard ball. Doom, 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 and that happens. What you need to explain is, look, it's Monday morning. The schools are open. It's raining. Too close. And one thing close. Uh, there was an accident. Boom. And it was, uh, oh, yeah, of course. That's it. How do we improve it? Well, maybe we change the, the time when the school's open. Or maybe we need to you know, misalign when office open and when school's over. There's nothing mysterious about it. But the granularity is wrong. And the teleological uh, 
explanation is also in place. So if you look at explanations in social sciences, that is exactly what you find. No one is able to explain to you or anyone why the Second World War happened. Uh, the granularity of billion boom, billion boom, 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 and that's what happens. Ridiculous. But we don't find that, oh, the Second World War happened miraculously or uh, you know, as a, the ultimate na- nightmare in human history or some extraterrestrial forces intervene. So, so, no, it was just it's just too complex in terms of that level of abstraction, that level of granularity. We can still start saying, like, Germany was going too big. Uh, the, 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 the empire, uh, the British Empire was uh, collapsing. Uh, the, the First World War problems had never been resolved, etc. And we have a debate, but we can definitely find an explanation. Now, that is what we are suggesting, or I'm suggesting, rather, uh, in the book. We need to change paradigm of explanation and be more relaxed about the fact that there's nothing magic, mysterious, uh, unexplainable intrinsically in an engineered product for the simple fact that we generated something, we created something that is you know, lots of elements interacting with each other, generating, of course, cause and interactions that we cannot explain at the microscopic level of node by node, etc., etc. Once you get this, you start realizing that a lot of hype and a lot of the newspapers talk that is just rubbish. Mm-hmm. No, I'm I'm so glad that you made this point about explanation and level of abstract of abstraction because I mean just today or the past few months, for instance, I mean Chat GPT may appear miraculous because it's so unfamiliar to us, but the reality is it's. I mean, I don't I don't use the word simple in a pejorative sense, but it it is a very simple machine but there's so just so much going on that it's we, we can't we can't possibly be expected to explain it at the level of granularity necessary to make it not appear miraculous to us if chat gpt uh, we don't know uh, chat gpt4 uh because open ai has become opaque uh, ai uh not so open very close uh so we know we know something about chat gpt3 and a little bit about 3.5 but almost nothing about 4 but that's okay and if uh, say it has a, a billion parameters. If the number of um, transformers uh, used is mind-boggling, one has needs to remember that every line is like Mary painted the house question mark, and the probability the question mark is replaced by blue, white, because John mm, goodbye is zero point four zero zero point zero. And then recalculate, recalculate, and end up by saying, no, white. That's the bottom line. Now, if we go back to uh, the beginning of our conversation, I said, well, maybe we need to understand all the new AI. And let me just make, make this, this particular remark, um, which explains a lot of the things we, we're discussing today. All the AI was a branch of mathematical logic. It was run, now its power horse, so to speak, uh, uh, was uh, the main... Uh, um, tool, uh, oversimplifying to the most, was deduction. If then. If you make that move with the white, I make this move with the black just to simplify chess etc. We move from AI as a branch of mathematical logic grounded on deduction to AI as a branch of statistics grounded on probability and correlation. Now, correlation and probability are by definition, intrinsically fa- not infallible. You're not working with a deterministic system. You're working with a system that is run running on the probability that the right answer to when Luciano Freud was born is 1994. Um, correct. Uh, but it's approach uh, probabilistically at the zero, zero, or whatever, uh, chances that they might be wrong. Now, once you know that, too, I'm not quite sure why people see so much in these um, tools, unless, final comment, they are degrading human intelligence. So the three grandfathers of uh, machine learning, I suspect, I actually went to check one of them, not bad mouth of anyone who is not here to defend himself, but I say people who think that they are approaching human intelligence is not because they have something that is as good as human intelligence, but because they have initially, you know, with a bad philosophical move, degraded human intelligence to 
a bunch of nodes you know, uh, triggered uh, according to uh, some thresholds and generating some probabilistic outcome. Well, if you have that limited view <laughs> of the human brain and intelligence, then necessarily you should be worried about something that you are creating, which will overcome that, if not uh, today, tomorrow. The trouble is that your reduction in this is wrong, and therefore the comparison is uh, not uh, justified. For the philosophers who are listening to this, there was the obsolete, very simplistic view that Hobbes had of thinking, reckoning. You see a horse, you see a horn, and you combine the two into a unicorn. For goodness sake, I mean, are we still there? I don't think so. Now, no one should make any mistake thinking that we learn, for example, by looking at a thousand uh, pictures of a cat, that that is a cat. Luckily, that's not how a baby learns that <laughs> to recognize a cat. <laughs> but that's how you know, the transformer, etc., etc., uh, does it. Now, nothing wrong with doing all this uh, syntactically. And let me remind you, this has got nothing to do with computers cannot do this, cannot do that. Not at all. As far as I know, the sky's the limit. It's just that we'll be doing it very, very differently from the way we do it, in the same way as the dishwasher doesn't do the dishes the way I do it. Hmm. Well, I'd like to get back to those five principles of ethics. Just one, because, I mean, even I wasn't familiar with the original four because I've never taken a bioethics course. But maybe we could talk just quite briefly about these five principles and how they're supposed to govern AI before in the little remaining time we have, we talk about some applications or real-world cases of them. I know the principles are, are, are pretty standard in, in, in bioethics. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's particularly interesting to comment on them, but, but I think it's important to, uh, to stress one aspect, which is when people talk about uh, AI ethics and the principles, and if you don't like those five, I mean... Uh, People are welcome to adopt uh, whatever other uh, set of principles they find around it. Doesn't matter. Uh, but um, the three categories, mm, no matter what, what set of principles you adopt, uh, independently, and that's uh, when uh, the proper good use of AI, the uh, misuse of AI, and the underuse of AI. And I think that maybe uh, is worth uh, spending a moment on the third category that we often forget. Uh, you find again this also in the book. Um, people think that uh, they're either used properly or, or not nicely, ethically, four, five, X number of principles, all not uh, aligned, or that's not the case. But there's a third category that I would like to uh, stress, which is the the underuse. Um, so um, if you uh, underuse uh, AI. Uh, which is what we stressed before uh, in terms of, for example, social problems, environmental issues, that is a huge responsibility. We have in our hands uh, an enormous uh, problem-solving um, capacity that we're not throwing at the problems that need desperately uh, to uh, find a solution. Uh, I'm not a religious person anymore, uh, but I still remember uh, being trained in uh, you know, uh, all the number of ways in which you could sin, and one way in which you can sin is by omission, um, uh, by not doing the right thing. Um, I think, in, for example, in the medical and environmental uh, areas, we are uh, huge sinners in terms of we are what we are missing, what we are failing to deliver. On that a good ethics and a good piece of legislation uh, can help a lot because a lot of what happens is essentially people not daring, not taking risks, preferring to be safe rather than sorry, and not using AI, which could be a, 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 sometimes even a life-changing uh, solution uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, uh, lack of clarity in terms of is this right? Is this wrong? Am I going to be uh, responsible? Is something that is going to bite me back? Uh, people would take me you know, to court uh, because you know, it is something that was unregulated and I just you know, released this product or you know, this service, etc. So there's a lot to be done, um, no matter what principles one can uh, subscribe to, uh, to make sure that uh, the misuse is curtailed, limited, not kept under control, but the underuse is also not put uh, something uh, under uh, the, the microscope, and we make sure that it's brought to the surface. 
the good uses, well, uh, there's plenty of that uh, all over the time, uh, all over the place. And we don't hear enough about that. Hmm. Well, I think it is worth at least uh, enumerating the five principles. So I'll just do that very quickly. And that's um, beneficence, which is promoting well-being. And then non-maleficence, non which at first I would have thought that these two w were just identical, but they're not. And that's doing no harm. And then I did have a question. So the third is autonomy. And that is just, we. it would be unethical to cede too much power to AI. Is that the idea? Uh, it's, it's also linked to the typical Kantian view, uh, whereby uh, autonomy um, uh, uh, not only should not, we should be careful in terms of uh, what we delegate to this form of agency, but we should also be incredibly careful uh, about how we use this agency to exploit human beings as means to an end. Typical you know, Kantian move, no, do not treat anyone uh, only as a means, uh, treat everybody always uh, as, as an end. Um, It's a beautiful um, uh, book by uh, Wiener, uh, the father of uh, cybernetics. Uh, I go by memory. I think it's entitled in, in English, uh, the, the Human Use of Human Beings. And uh, it was talking about cybernetics, but the problems were already there. Um, we're talking more than half a century ago. Uh, but he had already seen how autonomy not only should not be uh, carelessly delegated to machines, but also how we need to be careful not to erode human autonomy by the use of machines. So let me give you two simple examples. And this is not science fiction. It's just off-the-shelf stuff that we could do, we could have done years ago already. One is building autonomous weapons. This is not, not Star Wars. It's just ordinary. I mean, we could build a, a completely autonomous tank that does a complete mess uh, in Ukraine, remote control by some soldier in the middle of nowhere. I mean, after all, we remote control um, so, uh, robots on Mars. Surely you can have a... So the, the danger is that uh, the control would be limited. The risk would be high. We don't have the technology. Uh, it would be um, irresponsible uh, to build uh, that kind of technology today. Human on the loop human in the loop or at least human after the loop no so that decision can be rectified problems uh, do not get to the ultimate end and they become irrecoverable that is what we're talking about not delegating to machines the ultimate decision but that's got nothing to do with machines taking over uh skynet terminator it's human idiocy um it's a bit like saying look you you park your car uphill Make sure you know you put not the handbrake, uh, because otherwise it will autonomously go downhill. <laughs> it's on a wheelchair, uh, four wheels. No, no, no friction. Goodbye. Um, then complain that the uh, no the, the 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 vehicle had a, an autonomy of its own will be rather, rather stupid. So um, that is one way of autonomy. The other one is um, uh, using humans um, as just a, um, a resource. Um, as opposed to being the goal of our actions. And you now this is also everyday technology and uh, every recommended system uh, is constantly pushing and nudging and convincing us to do this rather than that. There is no conspiracy theory. There is nothing too nasty. You know, when I'm told that I might look this movie, uh, no, look at this movie or watch this movie because uh, I love the other movie, or uh, buy this because you bought that, or uh, you've been searching for such and such. So here is the product that might actually fit your search. But this nudging, this is eroding human autonomy as we speak. Now, for someone at my age, it might be too late <laughs> uh, to erode any autonomy that is still left. But imagine a, a kid born today, 18 years of nudging, um, gentle pushing, gentle pulling, and that kid might actually go to a school, decide about a job, have a particular holiday, have bought what he did, etc. For reasons that at some point you really, you look back and say like, who am I? Why, why I did that? Who, who made me do that? Why do I have these political sort of preferences or these 
food tastes. Now, that is, I don't want to overemphasize it, but it's part of the autonomy uh, principle you're talking about. Respect for human dignity and human autonomy has to be at the core of any AI design and any AI deployment. We stop thinking about that and we start treating humans as means to an end. And that is hugely, completely immoral. Now, it doesn't take a genius to understand this, does it? It's got nothing to do with uh, uh, existential risk and AI being like a, a nuclear bomb, but it does have uh, the life of billions of people uh, at stake, really, concretely. That is something that we need to control much more carefully. But that's what companies are a little more reluctant to hear. Mm-hmm. No, this this example of autonomous weapons really drives home the point very well, I think. And then, well, you, just an example. Look, uh, I think you can still find it on YouTube, so nothing secret. When Samsung was asked to build an autonomous weapon system to defend the border between North and South Korea, the first version was completely autonomous. It was target identification, shoot on target, 100%, no human required. The army, the South Korean army asked to have you know, people double checking and, and um, in the loop or on the loop. So it's not that we cannot build something that is completely you know, idiotic, <laughs> but it's human responsibility not to do that. In other words, there's nothing in the system that is wrong if you you not know, make the system explode under your feet. You are the idiot who actually you know, unplug uh, or plug in that particular uh, system. I'd like to stress this because otherwise the narrative we have these days is always like AI does this, AI does that. AI doesn't do anything. Someone decided to use AI in that context for those purposes. You don't like it, stop using it, stop designing it, including open AI. You don't like what you're doing, you are really serious about not something that is existential risk. Close the shop today. <laughs> don't pretend that no, AI is uh, that form of agency with... No, conscience, teleology, et cetera, et cetera. But you got the point. Mm -hmm. Well, so there are two last principles. I don't actually want to dwell on them too much because I had one uh, very important question that I wanted to get to. But the two are, one, justice, so promoting fairness and avoiding unfairness, and then explicability, which you mentioned earlier, uh, the importance of transparency. But what I really wanted to ask you before we finished, it's not, I guess, technically related to the book, but it is the the epigraph for your book. And in your epigraph, you write to, and I'm sorry if I, I mispronounce her name, uh, but to Jean Milliard, later Fiorella Floridi from 1937 to 2022, who loved and taught me the value of the adage, where one door shuts, another opens. And if I do not contrive to enter it, it will be my own fault. And that's from Don Quixote Cervantes. So I was wondering just what the epigraph uh, means to you. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that, that's my mom uh, who passed away uh, recently, and um, uh, uh, she was um, she liked technology uh, in general, uh, and uh, and she taught me that uh, uh, way of looking at the world. Um, and at the time, I, I mean, Benjamin uh, has. Uh, Benjamin has a, has a similar phrase uh, when when the door closes and the door opens, and I'm not sure whether he got it uh, from from where. But um, but when I was I, I I look into that particular sentence, I realized that my mom had told me only half of the story, uh, which was the first half uh, when one door closes and another opens. But I think the real lesson is in the second half uh, that how could you forgive yourself uh, not to take uh, uh, the chance of crossing the new open door is a sign of um, moderate optimism uh, towards human intelligence and um, the ability that humanity has had, even in the darkest moments of human history, to pull itself together and uh, do the right thing. Now, it is extraordinary to see how much harm humanity has inflicted on itself throughout the history. I mean, we just have to remember, you know, history of Europe uh, uh, that my, my father remembers, who is 88 and has seen um, German and American tanks in Rome. Can you imagine? Like, today seems to be, you know, extraordinary. Like, German tanks and American tanks in Rome, and yet that was the Second World War. Uh, and he was a little boy, and he still remembers that. 
So don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, we need to be aware of how much pain and darkness and horrors we have managed to inflict on Israel. And yet, the door stays open. And if we want to take that door, we can. So summarizing, I'm, I'm an optimist about opportunities, and I'm frustrated about our ability to grab those opportunities. We should work not on not only on the number of opportunities we have, but also on our ability to take advantage of those opportunities. And in our conversation today, that is called AI, but there's plenty of other opportunities all over the place. If only humanity were up to the opportunities that it builds for itself, we would be quite extraordinary. Uh, and we would avoid uh, so many things, uh, war included, uh, just around the corner in Europe. Well, I think that is a pretty perfect note on which to end. Uh, this was a, an absolutely terrific introduction to the ethics of AI. So thanks so much for thank talking you. with me, Luciano. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not <laughs> joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so.